Good morning. Thank you for joining me with our Sunday school lesson today. I hope all is going well with you and things are going as you would expect in preparing for Christmas. We are preparing for Christmas today, aren't we? The second Sunday in Advent. As we see how the Holy Spirit was at work in bringing us the child Jesus. This unit is about the Holy Spirit and how it has gifted us at this time of the year. The Holy Spirit is alive and well in each of us as a gift from Jesus as he sits at the right hand of God to be with us, transform us, and guide us to do his will. The Holy Spirit is a very active part of our lives as a Christian as it is with others in bringing others to Jesus. God abides with us through the Holy Spirit. We are studying lesson two today, and we'll see that the Holy Spirit is very active in this event that's taking place before uh, we get to the birth of Christ, which is the main event of Christmas. Isn't it? And it's about the announcement to Mary that she would bear the Christ child. It's a familiar passage to, the, to us this time of the year, I think all of us would agree on that one, that uh, we are reminded of what has taken place here, perhaps more so than others in this unit. It is a beautiful story of the virtuous mother of Jesus receiving the overwhelming news that she would be the mother of the Son of God born into the world. But the Annunciation was not just a fancy birth announcement, was it? It was a foretelling of the mighty work of God that Mary would experience soon. So if you have your lesson book with you, we're on page 16, second lesson. And uh, like I mentioned here, it's the second Sunday of Advent. And in our lesson today, Mary teaches us, if we just want to uh, know the main theme here, it teaches us through the Holy Spirit how to respond to God. And Mary what says yes. That's the title of our lesson. And the focal passage is Luke 1, 26 through 38. And the background text is Luke 2. And the purpose statement is to believe that for God, nothing is impossible. Before we get going, let's, let's go to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for you and your many blessings especially blessing us with the greatest gift that we could ever receive, and that's your Son, Jesus Christ. May we prepare adequately for your birth with great expectations as we study these lessons. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord. Amen. So Luke 1, 26 through 38, very familiar with uh, this passage here. Uh, especially studying at this time of the year. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen, since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the one <clears throat> who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's Son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. 
let it be with me just as you have said. And then the angel left her. And the key verse is, nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. <clears throat> let it be with me just as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This lesson focuses on a teenage girl whose life changed when she said yes to God and allowed Yahweh through the Holy Spirit to bring the unexpected to fruition. Her story inspires us to believe that with God, nothing is impossible. And I think we could all agree on that statement there. The first thing that <clears throat> Luke does here, he contrasts Zachariah's encounter with the Holy Spirit with Mary's. And we studied that lesson last week for the first lesson of this year. While both announcements reflect God's grace and goodwill, recognizable differences do emerge. Zechariah, if we remember, served in the temple as an elderly priest. His visitation by Gabriel took place in a holy city. Mary, an ordinary teenage girl without any special credentials on her resume, lived in an insignificant village in Galilee, the town Nazareth. And uh, Philip asked when Nathaniel invited him to meet Jesus, can anything from Nazareth be good? And Mary's re <clears throat> response also contrasted sharply with that of Zechariah. Zechariah showed doubt, whereas Mary accepted her role humbly, submitting to God's purposes without hesitancy. Luke described Zechariah and Elizabeth as a devout religious couple who were childish and yearned to divine for divine intervention. So their expectations were that this would take place at some point. In contrast, Luke introduced Mary without any honors whatsoever. Luke allows us to see God's favor at work in Mary as she willingly and obediently served as the agent of God's redemption of Israel. But there's one similarity I'd like to share with you that comes from the uh, teacher's guide here. And it is between the two of them, Zachariah and Mary, that we don't want to overlook. In each case, God bent down to incorporate humans into the plan of the salvation of the world. We're the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, aren't we? We're the body of Jesus Christ to get things done. And thank goodness. God has found a place to use us for our ultimate purpose here while we're on earth at this time. Humans were presented with something that was beyond them and seemed impossible. And uh, sometimes we, we think we're going to do it alone. We find out it does look impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It is God's nature to work through us. And God is summoning each one of us. And if you have heard God call you to be a God-bearer, one who brings the presence and word of God to the people. So that similarity uh, is, is that God can use any of us and let him to do the heavy lifting and we can do the light lifting, I guess is one way of putting it there. So <clears throat> in the announcement or enunciation captures our attention that Whatever Mary was doing, one thing remains clear. Gabriel's message interrupted a planned life. And she was already engaged to Joseph, so I'm sure they had some plans set out, but uh, they had not uh, involved in any type of relationship as far as it being sexual. A child is, it come, when a child comes into the picture of things, it does disrupt things. What I've heard one time saying that, uh, was that the children bring light into the world all day and all night. So <laughs> our sleep does uh, get interrupted for sure, if nothing else. And we might wonder what we would have said if placed in Mary's shoes. Maybe, excuse me, or thank you, but I'd really rather not. This is going to interrupt what? 
our plan. God's plans and other impositions seem rarely to coincide with our plans. And we doubt seriously that Mary had this in, in mind uh, at this time. We have a lot of carefully worked out agendas, don't we? And does God come in and say, hey, I want you to do this rather than this? Certainly, I think we've probably experienced that on occasion, and that's the Holy Spirit working in us and getting us to go a certain way. But God's interventions into our life foster humility and illuminate the prideful controller I am who dares to think that I would whatever we have scheduled for the day holds supreme importance. Who has the right to disturb our precious time? However, Mary responded, let it be with me, uh, just as you have said. She heard God's word and submitted. What lessons have we learned from the Holy Spirit's interruptions? A question we might want to ponder. I think we could probably say as we look back, and hindsight is 50-50, 2020, excuse me, God's plan far exceeds our plan. And uh, it uh, teaches us that God knows what is best. And so that brings on the sense of humility that uh, we're not number one. God is number one. Well, we find out that Mary was, was highly favored. Like Mary's selection time and again, we encounter biblical accounts that show God handpicking the most unlikely candidate on whom to bestow favor. Think about David. Young David. He was the youngest in the family, and uh, he was the least likely to be chosen uh, to be the king, uh, a shepherd boy. And Moses, a man of old age, at 80, was chosen to lead the Israelites out of uh, Egypt. And uh, he also had a speech impediment. And Aaron, his brother, was provided there to help him uh, to communicate. Uh, with the people. So after all, isn't our Creator able to shower surprising grace on whomever? Luke failed to speculate on the choice of Mary. You know, why Mary? The angel assured Mary of God's presence. We might recall God's words to Moses at the burning bush. And what was it? I will be with you. Uh, and the title of our main theme of all of our lessons for this a quarter is God abides with us. And God is assurance to Jeremiah, don't be afraid because of them, for I am with you to rescue you. What comforting word. Like Mary, we can relate to times and situations in our lives where we strongly felt God's presence. Thus, God's companionship alleviates our fears and uncertainties. Boldly proclaiming along with the Apostle Paul, if God is for us, who can be against us? Mary says, is, is what it looks like to believe that we already are who God says we are. The word favor equates to grace. I wonder how many people in our world today need to hear those words. You are highly favored. Do you? Well, why do you think God selected Mary to give birth to Jesus? I think grace is number one. Uh, and uh, she was humble. She was obedient. And she, uh, God could see into her heart. And I think uh, that would probably enter into the reasons that uh, God did select Mary there. And when in ways you might ask yourself, have you experienced God's favor? And I think we can all look back and see where God has uh, favored us in so many ways as far as uh, uh, living out our lives here while we're here on earth. Mary had little say in the matter of naming her child. She submitted completely, didn't she? The name Jesus derived from Joshua, meaning Yahweh saves. Son of God and Son of Most High are used in this scripture here as well. And this was a concept understood in ancient religious thought. The Greek and Roman mythology involved people with a human parent and a God parent. And the phrase Son of God also appeared 
in Hebrew thought. It was sometimes used to describe angels. So Jesus fulfilled the covenant made to David. Jesus' birth fulfilled the promise the prophet Nathan made to David in 2 Samuel of an everlasting dynasty. Only in the New Testament is the occur applied to Jesus, his divinity as Messiah, and as a member of the Trinity. Through him, God selected the true king who would reign over Jacob's descendants. Do you think the title, Son of the Most High, fits within the framework of Jesus' ministry? How do you believe Jesus lived up to that title? And I think if we uh, want to consider some answers to those questions, one might be that Jesus loved unconditionally, divinely, and uh, exponentially, I put. It showed no partiality. And how do we define God? God is love. So I think Jesus fulfilled that completely as far as Son of the Most High and living up to that uh, way of explaining as to who he would be. The Holy Spirit was at work in the whole situation that was taking place here. And the Apostle Creed declares Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Karl Barth offers clarity that Jesus is human-like 100%, but we are we, he's human-like, but also God-like 100%. Jesus' humanity has no limitations. Jesus, Barth said, is not just similar to us, he is like us. What consolation that we have there so that we can identify with Jesus. <clears throat> the Greek word overshadowed characterized God's presence in the Old Testament tabernacle, God dwelling with the Israelites. We might also think of the Spirit of God hovering above the water in creation. Do you remember the cloud in the Old Testament that symbolized the presence and power of God leading the Israelites? The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary with presence and power. Luke allows us to envision the active, creative, productive work of the Holy Spirit that brought about conception in Mary's womb. The virgin birth surpasses human comprehension, doesn't it? That, that Jesus is 100% human and 100% divine. So what are ways the Holy Spirit works in the life of the church, your faith, community, and your life? Is that through the body of Jesus Christ? We're the hands and feet. So whatever we do that Jesus has asked of us, we uh, He has sent the Holy Spirit to see to it that we have that in us to inspire us and lead us uh, in responding to the needs of others, both physical uh, and spiritual. Well, nothing impossible with God. Gabriel called Mary's attention to the situation with her relative Elizabeth. Don't you know they can identify with one another? Both of them had had a miracle take place in their lives. Again, nothing's impossible with God. Once Mary, now Elizabeth found herself in her six months of pregnancy through a miracle from God. God's creative work brings about extraordinary events through the Holy Spirit. The question, is anything impossible with God, referred to Elizabeth's present situation, but it also found strands of unity with Sarah in the Old Testament. She was in old age. That was Abraham's wife before they uh, had a child there. So, you know, it, it, this exemplifies the way that God can do things. Mary responded, let it be with me just as you have said. Whatever God says, God will do. For nothing will be impossible with this word spoken by God. Mary's response was, I am the Lord's servant, or the Lord's slave. She submitted to the will of God. What? There's not a better way to respond to God uh, when he calls on us as far as him working through us and doing the impossible. 
Do you believe the words nothing would be impossible with God? Or do we sometimes think there are things not possible for God to accomplish in our world, our churches, and our lives? Believing in the promise of the words does not mean that God will always grant all our wishes. Rather, it affirms that we serve a God unlimited to our way of thinking and acting. And, and acting. So, let me leave you with this thought as we conclude our lesson today. Don't be surprised that God may want to work the impossible in your life, or maybe uh, he has already done it. And I also want to remind you that a uh, quote by William Ward, the, medio the mediocre teacher tells, think in terms of Jesus being the teacher. The good teacher explains. The superior teacher demonstrates. The great teacher does what? Inspires through the Holy Spirit. Too. So Jesus inspires us in all of these ways, but especially through the Holy Spirit to do the impossible. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. In faith, I declare nothing is impossible with God. Help me in my times of doubt and unbelief. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.